Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our workshop, AT for Aging in Place at Home. We will be led today by Jose Pena, who is the manager of independent living services at the Dale McIntosh Center in Orange County, and who prior to his management role, served as the assistive technology coordinator for the DMC. Tonique McNair, who is the assistive technology advocate at Marin Center for Independent Living in Marin County, and Michelle Rosado, an AT advocate for Disability Resource Agency for Independent Living located in the Central Valley. This workshop will be focused on the practice of self-determination, recognizing that people have the right to decide how they wish to spend their lives and providing tools that can assist in facilitating those wishes with arguably one of the most important elements of self-determination being the decision to age in place, we'll be diving right into this topic by covering information regarding durable medical equipment and devices that can be easily utilized out of the box to provide immediate solutions to challenges people experience when aging in place. We'll then provide information about items that can be more permanently installed, and we'll close out by addressing concerns that one must consider when installing permanent assistive technology. We are reserving the last 15 minutes of our workshop for Q&A, so please post your questions in the Q&A located in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen, or use the raise hand function located in the meeting controls if this is the most accessible option. And we'll try our best to address everyone's questions with the time we have. Check the chat for the stream text link, and please note that the chat is reserved for networking and interacting with one another. So have fun connecting in the chat, but any and all questions for our panelists should be entered into the Q&A or signaled with a raised hand. Now, before I hand it over to our opening panelist, Jose Pena, I'd like to introduce our panel's sponsor, Joy for All Companion Pets and their representative, Jim Murphy. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh... Thank you to Daryl uh, Lido and the rest of the C4A uh, leadership for uh, in, in extending uh, an offer to participate. Um, so for those of you that participated in a workshop or attended a workshop earlier today, you may have heard me share um, some information as it relates to ageless innovation and our joy for all companion pets. Um, for those of you that didn't, um, just a, a quick note on who we are and what we're all about. Um, which is um, at Ageless Innovation, um, our flagship product um, and really our reason for being is um, to uh, provide joy and companionship through our Joy for All companion pets, which are robotic or animatronic companion pets. Um, and we've been working with many states and state units on aging, AAAs and other members of the aging network, um, especially over the course of the last year to be able to provide positive psychosocial benefit and combat social isolation and loneliness um, during this uh, COVID-19 um, crisis. And, and so, uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited um, about the fact that you all chose assistive technology as a theme for the day, a theme for your virtual conference. Um, it, it obviously plays an extremely important role in general and an extremely important role as it relates to combating social isolation and loneliness. Um, and uh, for this panel and aging in place at home, uh, you know, that uh, once again, plays an extremely important role. So excited to hear from the panelists and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jose to get us kicked off. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Catherine, if you could share the slide. Thank you, I appreciate it. Hello everyone, my name is Jose. I'm going to be speaking assistive technology for aging in place. During my presentation, I will go ahead and provide about, talk about assistive technology that you could just use out of the box to help you with staying at home independently. Uh, if we could go to the next slide to go to the overview of the presentation. I will start off by defining assistive technology just to make sure that everyone in the presentation notes what I'm talking about when I say assistive technology or AT. And I'm going to talk about certain devices that can help you age it in place. And I'll finish off with durable medical equipment. And next slide. So assistive technology is just any AT device, gadget, hardware, or software used by a person with a disability 
who are having trouble with themselves or are trying to do a task that might be difficult for them to do because of their disability. Uh, one thing to note about AT is that AT is not a one size fits all. So although they might, I guess products will advertise market for certain disabilities just because it's targeted for that disability, doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to work. So as we are working with consumers, individuals with disabilities, we wanna make sure to provide them options so they can make an informed decision of whether or not the, the device will end up working for them. Next, we'll go into what assistive technology could help me do. Uh, so assistive technology can help with walk, talk, read, eat, play, hear, use a computer, cook, and live independently at home. So that last one is the, the important one. So then I, after this, I decided, well, what are some of the things that, what are the activities of daily living that we have to do in order for us to stay in the community and live independently at home, especially as we start to age? So the first one would be help with personal care. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. I'm was looking at the wrong screen. So as the assistive technology coordinator, one of my biggest one of my biggest challenges was looking outside the box to see what products were available and how they could help either seniors or people with disabilities. And a lot of times we focus on assistive technology or think about specialized products that are available without looking at different products that are already in the market and might work for us. For example, when someone is showering, a regular bottle of shampoo might not be the best option, but a shampoo with a pump could be a lot more accessible to, to individuals. So realizing what's out there in the market and just brainstorming to see what are the challenges that we're facing and, and provide different solutions. Uh, same thing with the bottle of shampoo it could be a toothpaste or, or as, as it's seen right here on the screen, there's an adaptive nail clipper that's attached to the, a piece of cardboard so you can lay it flat on the ground and now you don't have to use both hands at the same time to clip your nails. With, with items like this, it's enabling individuals to be able to take care of their personal care as they're going through some of their activities of daily living. Uh, next slide, please. So then we go into dressing. Uh, when, when dressing, there is a lot of this technology that you could just buy and, and start using, but also changing the way we look at certain clothing. For example, there's sock assist that's available for individuals who can't uh, reach down or just having problems putting on their socks. With this type of device, you could wrap your sock around it and you could do it while sitting down without having to bend over. There's also a button hook for if, if you're wearing a button down shirt and, and you have dexterity issues that make it a little bit difficult for you to do this. You could use a button hook, which I have a picture on the bottom right. You basically slide this through the hole, clip the button and then pull and it does it for you. It gives you a bigger grip, which enables you to not have to deal with those smaller pieces and that are complicated. Other things are just looking at adaptive clothing. Uh, once again, I, I look at items that are not assistive technology. In this, I have a picture of a shoe that uses straps rather than shoelaces, but there's different options as well as slip-on shoes that individuals could use and now they don't have to worry about tying your shoes or your shoes coming untied and then you, you, you could trip over them. So just looking at adaptive clothing, there's also clothing available that instead of using buttons, it uses Velcro, which makes it a lot more accessible, easier to put on, easier to take off. And just looking at the different options that are available really changes the way we do things. And to finish off this slide, I also have a picture of a shoehorn. A shoehorn is similar to the sock assist. If you're having issues putting your shoes on or you can bend over with the shoehorn, you could put it on the back of your shoes and slide your foot a lot easier. I, 
I personally use one of these when, when putting on shoes because of my disability. And, and it really helps what, what you're able to do with, with these devices to help yourself dress. Next, we go into cooking devices and eating. Uh, what, one of the things is it's a chopper. When, once you start, depending on your disability, chopping food is always, it's always a difficult task, whether you have a disability or not. Dealing with knives, they're very sharp. So just figuring out what other options are available. And sure, we could buy groceries that are already cut up for us, but I have a picture of a, ch of a chopper on the, on the screen. And the way you use this is you put an onion, a tomato, and you just push down. This will chop for you, ensuring that you're not putting your fingers in, in, in the way of a knife. There's no, there's, it's a lot easier to use. You could just push down and it collects everything for you. So you don't have to worry about the mess. Uh, if you do prefer to go the traditional way of using a knife, there's also gloves specially made to prevent cutting and burning. This, this is very important because as, as we're moving things, if, if we burn ourselves and we could drop whatever we're holding, which creates a tripping hazard and, and then puts it in jeopardy of, of uh, losing our independence. There's also things like timers, automatic can openers and bottle openers. Uh, again, opening cans could be difficult. They do have cans with lids that may, may work for some, but if that's not the case, there's automatic can openers as well. And, and those really help with hands-free. You could just put the can on there. It'll do it for you. And uh, on the next one would be an adaptive utensils or plates. There's non-slip plates. So when we're eating, the plate's not going all over the place. But one of the things I really like is the adaptive utensils and how far they've come. I have a picture on the slide of this self-stabilizing spoon. And this really worked for people with hand tremors. Before this, there was a, there's a lot of utensils that use weight to try to deal with the tremors. But when this one came out, I really liked it because it, it helps stabilizing on its own and it, and it has a bigger grip, which makes it easier to grab, but it actually enables someone to eat whenever they want to. So if someone has hand tremors and they're having difficulty using a the spoon, then a lot of times people expect us to depend on an individual to feed us or a caregiver to help us. But having this spoon enables us to, to eat when we want, to go out to restaurants without having to worry about will they have adaptive equipment or not. You could easily just pack this in your bag and go. And it gives you that freedom and liberty of eating whenever you want to. And, and, and if it works for you, it's, a, it's great to, it's a great help. So, then I started thinking a little bit more about what are some of the, as I was thinking about aging in place, seniors and seniors really came up. And I started thinking of two disabilities that really affect the elderly population. One of them was vision loss. And on the next slide, it will, will be hearing loss. But with vision loss, I found some really neat products that I was teaching my consumers as I was the assistive technology coordinator. One of them is talking prescriptions. If you're unable to read the label that really puts you in danger of either being over medicated, under medicated, or just taking the wrong prescription at the wrong time, I have a picture to the right of talking prescriptions, and that's a script talk station. That's a station that your pharmacy could provide free of cost. Some pharmacies provide different alternatives, but I chose the script talk because it's one that I really like. But what it does is when you go to your pharmacy, they give you a, a bottle with an RFID at the bottom that you could place on top of the station and it will read it for you. It will tell you what medication it is, how often you need to take it, and, and what the medication is for. So this really helps when trying to identify what, what medication I'm, I'm about to take. Uh, Assistive technology doesn't always have to be about just the things we have to do. 
could be for recreational or leisure pur purposes as well. That's why I included the next one, audio descriptions on TV. A lot of times we're not aware of the different audio, uh, the different languages available. But one of the options when you go to the different audio settings for television is audio description, which will basically tell you what's going on on TV when there's silence or when something's going on that there's not too much spoken feedback. So someone with vision loss could still know what's going on without necessarily having to see the screen. Uh, another thing that I included is tactile markings, uh, also known as bump dots. When, when a person's losing their, their vision, I used to get the question a lot of, well, now that I lost my vision, how am I going to use this microwave that doesn't have any, any raise buttons? It's, it's just flat, and I'm going to need to buy a new one. But actually, by being able to tactile different devices, you're enabling the, the individual to still use the devices that they're currently using. You just have to mark some of the main settings. And by using your touch, you can know what exactly you're pressing. And that way, it also saves you money because you don't have to go out and buy a specialty device. You could continue using the device you already have at home. We're just adapting it in order for it to work for you. There's also magnifiers available. I have a picture on the slide of a portable handheld magnifier. And this is just a magnifier that you could buy at the store. It comes with different magnification settings and very simple to use, and it could help you with reading and uh, other tasks. Talking clocks, knowing what time it is is very important. I, sometimes we don't think about it because if we don't have vision loss, we could just look down at our phone and, and find out what time it is. But, if, but being able to have maybe like a talking clock, a keychain clock that you could press a button and it'll tell you the time will keep you on your schedule and you'll know what, what time it is at all times. And there's also large print phones. So you can see the buttons a lot better. These phones typically come with different contrast as well, whether black on white or white on black to give you a much better view of the phone. And some of them also speak. So they tell you what number you're pressing as you're going. Uh, next slide, please. And then we, we go into the second disability that I identified as one of the ones that really affects the elderly population and it's hearing loss. Some of the things that I used to demonstrate in my old position was flashing doorbells. And then there's similar to the audio description, there's closed captioning on television that way if someone has hearing loss, they could follow along, or if they're deaf, they could still know what's going on by the closed captions. There's also the pocket talker. Uh, I know there's hearing aids available, but the pocket talker is a little bit different. Pocket talker is a sound amplifier, and I have a picture of it. It looks like a, it's a handheld device, probably half the size of a cell phone with a microphone and earphones. You put it on, and what this device does is just amplify sound. I used to use this a lot during meetings when an individual was sitting in the back or they had hearing loss, that way they could still hear what's going on even if someone's across the room. And uh, going back, there's flashing alarms as well. Safety is was always one of my biggest priorities. And if there's a fire, if there's carbon monoxide and the alarm is ringing, but you have hearing loss or you're deaf and you can't hear it, this flashing alarm basically flashes a light alarming you that there's either and there's something going on in your house. And there's also caption phones and higher decibel phones. The caption phones, similar to like the transcript that's going on right now, it tries to transcript what the call is saying and it, it could help you make out some of the words that you, you may be missing. And then also the higher decibel phones just make it a little bit easier to hear when the phone is ringing. And it also amplifies the voice of the person on the other side. That way you could, that way it's louder and hopefully it could help you hear them a lot better.
Next slide. So then there's other assistive technology that I thought it was important. One of the big ones is the medical alert device. This is a device that you could wear around your neck. And if you were to fall down, you could press this device and it'll connect you with a dispatcher. The dispatcher could then either make a call to 911, the paramedics, or maybe a family member to let them know then that you, you need some help. There's also pill reminders. Uh, if there's memory loss going on with these pill reminders. It'll, the picture I have here on the right is a reminder that will actually ring and it won't stop ringing until you open it, therefore ensuring that you're taking the medication all the time. I included the chatterbox as well. I find it funny because I think it's the opposite of the, the voice amplifier. A chatterbox is just a device that you could wear with the speaker so that it amplifies your phone. So if you have a very low pitched voice and you could use a ch chatterbox to, to amplify your voice. And then we get into the Roomba, which I think it's important for cleaning. And this is just a device that you wouldn't necessarily have to uh, go around sweeping, mopping. You could just turn on the Roomba and let it do it all on its own. Uh, going back to the assistive technology is not always targeted to people with disability. Uh, the cell phone charging pad is something that really caught my attention. I originally bought it when it first came out because I thought it was a cool concept and it would always keep my phone charged because when I'm on my desk, I just put it down. But then I started thinking about the accessibility features and what this means for people with disabilities because now we don't necessarily have to grab the charger and try to put it in the little hole. Now we have this space where we could just lay it. And if our phone is compatible, then we're able to just charge our phone without having to deal with, am I putting it correctly? And it, it's just an, another great example of how sometimes assistive technology or technology in general is not targeted for people with disabilities, but we'll take it if it works for us. And the last one I included is just a grabber. Uh, once again, if you drop a, if you drop something on the floor, or if you use a wheelchair, you could use this grabber to reach things that you drop. Or if it's on a higher shelf, you could also use this grabber to reach for things that are out of your reach. Next slide. So then we go into the voice assistant. The voice assistant or the devices like Alexa, the, the Google Home, Cortana, or Siri, these smart devices, uh, these voice assistants bring in another level of accessibility and access to individuals, regardless of their technology proficiency. They are not as difficult to use because all you're basically doing is using different commands and one thing I really like about them is that as the voice assistant market grows, so does the devices that go along with them. Um, for this one, I won't go into greater detail since there's a great presentation coming up after this workshop that will focus on voice assistants and making your home a smart home. So I'll, that's a little introduction to the next workshop, but voice assistants are great. Uh, next, we move into DME. And DME to make your home more accessible. So I think here we all know that home modifications could be really expensive. And there's many common barriers that can make staying at home a difficult challenge. Some of the most common examples that we see are thresholds, bathtubs, steps, beds, toilets. And I'm not saying DME could take the place of a home modification, but in some cases it does work. Uh, three examples, uh, three pictures that I have on the screen is a vice grip tub grab bar, a portable shower, and a transfer bench. The, the transfer bench enables someone to sit down and slide into the tub rather than have to step over. And, and the vice grip would also work as a grab bar. So going back to the price of home modifications and what's available, uh, these could be good options. 
As far as threshold and steps, there's portable ramps available that could be used to, to make a home more accessible. I would check the safety of it and make sure that the slope is correct. But if you're going over one step or maybe a threshold, this could be a much easier solution rather than having to, to do a whole home modification. And for, for the toilet, there's uh, toilet seat risers, there's toilet seat grab bars available that just go over the device. You could go to CVS and get them. And uh, those are other options. And for the beds, there's a bed assist bar that goes on the side of the side of your mattress to help yourself pull yourself up. And there's also Hoyer lifts available. Hoyer lifts are to help someone transfer from maybe a bed to a wheelchair. And then uh, the last device I'll speak about is the electric recliner to assist with standing up. Uh, if you're in a sitting position and it's difficult for you to get up, there's there's uh, electric recliners that tilt over with the press of a button to make standing up a lot easier. Uh, like I mentioned, these durable medical equipment are good alternatives, but making sure that the individual is the most important thing. So uh, not trying to cut costs, but just figuring out, is this a good alternative? Is this gonna put someone in danger? If the answer is yes, then I think a home modification would be more ideal. With that being said, now I will hand it off to Tanique, who would speak more about the permanent home modifications. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, a lot of the information here. I hope I can add some additional information. I'm going to try to share my screen. That can work. Hi, Tonique. We're actually we're getting a little bit of a robotic feedback on your microphone. Um, maybe you might want to fiddle with the uh, the jack, possibly. Still the same, better, much better. Or Thank you. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, so let me. Oh, you, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, let's go. All right, so modifications, aging in place. Again, my name is Tonique and I am the AT um, advocate Ed Marin, Saint Marin Steel. Okay, why home modifications? As a result of aging and decreased mobility, our homes are, our homes may require um, some type of modification as Jose mentioned earlier, the purpose of home modifications are the, to meet the needs of the individual's disability and also to make the home more accessible. Here's an example of an individual that really needed accessibility. This I'm, I'm really home. sorry. I'm really sorry to interrupt, Tonique, but it, it's getting funny again. Is there any kind of adjustment we can make? I don't know what to do. I tried a couple of different things. I think it may just be interacting with your collar. I thought we might work this part out. It might have just been rubbing against your collar. Tonique, are you still there? All right, I apologize people. It looks like we're having a little bit of te technical difficulties. We're gonna go ahead and give Tonique just a few moments to get her audio um, sorted out. Thank you for being so patient with us.
Tonique, if you can hear us, maybe you can just go ahead and use your regular computer audio. Catherine, it looks like she dropped out. Yeah, it does. Maybe she's trying to reconnect. Well, why don't we, if you're okay, Michelle, if you want to go ahead and kind of start on your portion, and if Tonique joins us, we can kind of make it work together. Sure, sure. Uh, so Tonique, well, well, first of all, thanks everybody. Um, I'm gonna try to jump in about how, um, what to consider for home modifications. And Tonique, when she jumps back on, will kind of give you a visual of the types of home modifications. So uh, let me share my screen. All right, so my name is Michelle Rosado. I'm the AT advocate for the San Joaquin County at DRAIL or Disability Resources Agency for Independent Living. Um, let's see. So one of the biggest um, challenges that I find or considerations are setting the right consumer expectations. And that's a whole, um, that's a huge issue that I think that you want to address right at the beginning and kind of throughout the project. Um, one of the biggest ones would be the scope of work that's needed. It's really critical to review what work goes into a project, review the line items on your bid carefully, um, a bid should reflect the cost of materials and labor, but it should also identify the steps, what's going to actually happen in a full-blown project. Um, another um, challenge could be the cost of the home modification project. That's usually the biggest challenge, to be honest, um, and kind of dealing with a consumer sticker shock. And so in order to alleviate that or kind of uh, realize what a project may cost, we recommend that you try to get two to three bids from separate vendors. And so when I say bids, I mean the estimates for the actual project that you're trying to work on. Um, many grants or loans will require more than one and you want it to be identical. So if you're trying to compare, let's say a wooden ramp versus a uh, concrete ramp, you know, that's that's one thing. But once you've actually established which direction you want to go, your bid should basically be, if you're going to stick with the wooden ramp, then your two or three bids should be for wooden ramps. That way you're comparing apples to apples. Um, based on the budget, you may need to consider scaling down a home modification project or breaking up projects into smaller ones. And um, it's kind of what Jose said, there's some options out there that could help cut the costs in some in some cases, maybe be some alternatives. We have to kind of get a discussion going about all of those and see, prioritize what's the biggest need for a consumer. Okay, and before we move on, I'm sorry to interrupt Michelle, but Tonique mm -hmm. has joined us. Um, now that we've kind of looked at some of the considerations, maybe we can look at some of the items, that way we can have a good yeah. idea sure. of what considerations we're um, looking at. Okay, so I can stop sharing mine and then we can jump over to Tony. Give me one sec. There Big you go. thank you to our wonderful and flexible panelists. Teamwork makes a dream work, guys. We got to do it. <laughs> and Tony, we can't hear you. You don't have your, um, your audio turned on. How about, how about there now? You, perfect, and yes. you sound crystal clear. Okay, yes, you still can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. There's a little bit of fuzz, but um, people can let me know in the chat if it's problematic. And, and, and I work with AT, so I don't even know. But anyway, let's go, let's go. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me go back.
Okay. All right. So, as I was saying, um, that the one of the main purposes of home modifications um, is to meet the need of the individual's disability, and also again to make it accessible. I think I started. I left off with this um, picture of a. Um, it looks like a um, step stool, a step ladder that you would use in your kitchen, maybe. And this consumer was using this step stool to get in and out of her home. And when she called and told me that, I cringed. So I'm so grateful for these programs because we are able to assist individuals and we were able to provide her with a um, uh, this step to be, be able to get in without the um, possible loss of life or limb any further. Home modifications allow us to continue to live safely and independently in our home. The modification should be viewed as a preventive measure rather than limiting or um, indicating a decline. Here are some suggestions, like our accessibility suggestions. For example, to install um, a threshold ramp uh, wherever possible when throughout your home or entering um, different doors and even within the home sometimes um, uh, there may be a, a threshold that might be difficult and for individuals who are not able to lift their foot uh, or if they're in a wheelchair um, having something like this makes it more accessible for them when um, handrails i started off with outdoor handrails um, make sure that you repair any steps um, make everything even. Here on um, this particular uh, picture is this uh, adhesive or um, a non-slip adhesive to prevent falls, to make it um, safe for you, for an individual during um, when it's wet. And you also want to make sure that the stairs and the access to and from your home are well lit. There's indoor rails. Placing rails in your home as I showed on the outside, are always helpful. Um, make sure to keep the entryway clutter-free. Um, pick up, um, uh, what do you call those? Uh, rugs, like out, keep the rugs out of the way because you don't want to trip over them. They're a major, a major um, hazard. And you can also have handrails on both sides of the step. That makes it also more accessible. And then I go to um, ramps. Um, I, I'm kind of switching around because there's kind of a method to the flow. Um, these are additional modifications. This is a picture of a modular ramp. And a modular ramp is good for um, a covering a longer distance. So you need a place for um, a person to be able to access and it's a longer distance. Also, um, a, uh, I have a picture of a switchback modular ramp. If, if you notice, the steps are very steep on this, or they're steep on this um, the step. So if you were to put a ramp there, it would make it very um, dangerous for a person in a wheelchair or even someone trying to push, them, push themselves up in a walker. So you want to try to use a switch, a switch um, back ramp or a um, uh, chair lift or a porch lift. Porch lift is probably, in, in, if you can notice how steep the steps are there, um, that makes it more accessible and it takes up less space as well. So I use a porch lift or a chair lift in those, in those um, situations. Then I go from there to a chairlift or um, inside the home. Um, depending upon how many levels you have, depending upon how much space you have, there are a variety of kinds of options. This one is, it, it kind of like swirls around and goes up. Some, I have one, uh, different ones, I don't have it in this, this presentation, where it was like a three level and the individual, um, it, it wasn't, a, the way that it was set, it's kind of staggered level, so they would have to take the, uh, the lift up to 
to the first level and then walk like over to the next lift, get on that that stair lift and take it up like three or four more steps. Next we have grab bars. And I particularly chose this particular picture of grab bars in tiles because oftentimes when people when they talk about grab bars, the first thing they say is they don't want to have them installed because they don't want to mess up the um, aesthetics in their bathroom, their tile. They don't want to um, um, destroy it in any kind of way. The, all of our contractors are, are um, knowledgeable and know exactly how to do this so that that damage cannot occur. Now here's a before and after shot of uh, the conversion of a bathroom shower, a bath shower. Um, it, uh, the thing that's interesting here that I want to mention is that you, you, the space, you would not believe that you can still use the same space to make it accessible for a rolling shower for an individual um, to get in and out. Um, or even for someone, I do apologize to noise in the background, but to make it even more accessible for someone that might be in a wheelchair or someone who um, needs more space to walk in, because as time, the, the rise of the tub becomes increasingly more difficult for people to get in and out of the tub. So using this walk-in shower is helpful. I have another picture of, of, of um, before and after shower conversion. This one has a clear glass door. I would not necessarily encourage glass doors, um, particularly if the individual is not stable, um, like the possibility of using a tension rod to be more accessible for privacy and so on, because uh, the glass doors that can really injure themselves. The grab bars you can see also are installed for safety. There's a, there's a chair to, uh, instead of, um, it wouldn't necessarily need a shower, a shower chair, a, a separate standalone. It can use the one that is comes with the bathroom, or it's part of the um, it's part of the remodel of the bathroom. So, what's available? We offer word-free project man management to start finish um, from start to finish, which is that we assist you with hiring the contractor, whether we hire the contractor. Um, and this is available throughout uh, the California um, ILCs. Everyone's ILC may have some variances, but for the most part, we kind of do some of the same things. Um, we uh, will help you with it to determine the scope of work for your project, which is very important because um, as um, Michelle will talk about later in her presentation about why that's so important. And I just want to say um, particular parts of the scope of work to be like um, you, you come in and you want to do, say, the shower conversion, but there is not funding for that. Um, so we might have to swim, swim down on it or change the expectation. But again, she's going to talk further. Um, and while someone said there's no cookie cutter projects, all of our all of our projects are designed to meet the individual situation. So depending upon what the disability is or what the situation is with your home, how your home is set up, what your needs are, we're trying to make it work for you as much as possible. Now, next step: consumers must complete an established goal, which is an intake. Um, it should be, or the consumers should be moderate to low income according to God, uh, H, the HUD guidelines. A, uh, an older adult or a person with disability. Now, I, I say these um, basic guidelines, and this, these basic guidelines are for, particularly for grants. And it's important to mention that all of the things that we talked about, the grants are not always available. But when they are available, they require a lot of um, requirements from us to make sure to, that you're eligible. And we assist you with that ability. We assist, we assist you with 
making um, sure that you have um, making sure that you have all the necessary paperwork and um, having the bid proposals, having the pictures, and having all the necessary things to, to get you ready for this. And I think that's it. And with that, I'm going to switch back to Michelle and take it away, Michelle. Thank you, Tonique. Let me now share my screen again. Um, there we go. Okay, so we left off in a perfect spot. Um, like Tonique was saying, we want to discuss the consumer expectations. Um, so we wanna address concerns early on in our project. We wanna check in on the progress. Um, you wanna discuss color, finishes, materials, layout, all those sort of things that you may not think of right off the bat, but I promise you it's good to discuss with your consumer and your contractor and be on the same page because in a bid, a contractor might be providing an estimate based on certain materials, uh, based on what they might have available in the shop that may or may not jive with what the consumer is requesting. So you wanna make sure you have those conversations. Uh, payment schedule is really important as well. You wanna determine when and how the contractor will be paid throughout the project. And the service providers or the AT advocates are pretty well versed in how to go about navigating that process, especially if it's a grant. Um, we'll have that discussion with the contractor directly. Um, timelines of your projects. So when I say timeline, I mean both consider the funding application process, which can be timely depending on who you're applying with. Um, um, and when I say that, like Tonique mentioned, um, she mentioned one when you're using HUD guidelines, but there's a few different grants where it's almost like a scholarship, if you would think. Um, they kind of come up with the guidelines, they come up with the rules, and they have their own deadlines that they have to meet. So it's not a one size fits all at all. Um, so you want to make sure that you set that that consumer expectation correctly so the consumer understands about how long they may it might take to hear back. Um, also, contractors availability and schedule, that could vary because by the time you get funding in place, maybe a contractor schedule is booked for a little while. So you wanna make sure that you're having these conversations openly and that they understand it's a process. It's never overnight when you're trying to work with an independent living center, but I promise you a lot of the stress and um, um, some of the details being overwhelming, it's really helpful to work with an advocate if you can. Um, so another thing to consider is the time of the year. I find that it can be a little bit more challenging booking a contractor during the busy spring and summer months. Um, some of them are, are, are a little more booked out than others, but that's one of the things that I would consider as well. So you wanna just check in. Uh, let me see. Sorry, my screen's not switching. There we go. So determining the correct scope of work. So the cheapest is not always the best. Tonique showed some great pictures of good examples. I'm showing you a big no-no here. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I find is when a consumer calls asking for a ramp, one of the first things that I ask is, give me some information on where you live. Do you live in a mobile home? Do you live um, on a one level? You know, it's going to be very different for a mobile home versus uh, um, someone on a, on a lower level. And as you can see, this is not a mobile home, but it's, it's a very similar issue. The rise, meaning the steps and the, from the, the distance from the ground to the landing is going to be higher. And so safely, you don't want to consider trying to push anybody up a ramp this steep. It's, it's nothing that an independent living center or any good contractor is gonna suggest. So sometimes when a consumer is kind of doing their own research, they might have something like this in mind and it's a really good visual to show that this is honestly way more dangerous than just leaving the stairs as is. Um, so in this, in this picture, I just wanted to show that the challenge here could be the accessibility to the front entrance, 
front entrance when dealing with the with a large rise, the distance, like I said, from the ground to the landing. Um, alternative solutions, uh, Tonique had showed the porch lifts. Those are pretty common. Um, you'll see those more often in a mobile home park as well because of the sheer size. A ramp would need to be built to take up the space, so that might be a better option. Another thing that we might look during an assessment, is there a better or a back entrance that is easier to access and install a ramp? So I wanted to show this because this is a pretty common request that we get from both service providers or other agencies. When they hear ramp, one ramp does not, uh, one size does not fit all. So I wanted to kind of point that out. Um, another challenge or consideration is tips for hiring contractors. Now I was able to get a lot of this information from the California State License Board. Um, like Tony can mention, you'll wanna check with your local ILC for a list of vendors and, or contractors that are skilled at, this, um, at these home modifications. They're gonna know what they're doing. They're gonna, um, many of them are gonna have information or have pictures that you can kind of view. Um, you're gonna wanna get at least three identical construction bids. I would say two to three. Some, some grants will allow two, most of them are gonna ask for three, but um, the reason that you wanna be comparing the same is you wanna know if there's a big difference between one vendor or another. Um, you know, a huge difference in cost, why? What's going on? Are the materials different? Is the labor charge different? So that's the reason for having the um, the multiple bids, and also to get the consumer to understand what they're what they're looking at. What's the real um, cost of a job? You can consider searching for contractors online for additional reviews. You can you want to determine whether your project will require a building permit. Oftentimes, the smaller projects will not. But again, in scale, you just have to find out what your personal project will need. Um, you can always check the contractor's license number to make sure it is current and in good standing. And you can do that at www.cslb.ca.gov or the California State License Board's website and the phone number is there as well. It's 1-800-321-CSLB or 2752. Um, more tips. So you want to ask if your contractor carries general liability insurance. That's important. You want to make sure you get a detailed written contract before any work begins. Specifics about project materials, labor costs, timelines, like I mentioned before, should all be in that contract. Um, if you're working with an independent living center, often we're the ones that handle that for you and we'll work together. You don't want to sign a contract you don't understand. So that's really important. Again, you'll want to work with your advocate so that if you need some additional um, communication or if you need some additional explaining, you really want to take the time to do that because ultimately this is your home. You're going to have to live with this project. And um, there is some level of risk when anytime you're hiring a contractor, you just want to make sure that you understand what's going into it. The other factor there is sometimes when a home modification or oftentimes if we're able to get a grant, that could be a one time shot. We may not be able to get a grant two, three, four years down the line to be able to um, fix anything that's caused from wear and tear or additional modifications. So you want to make sure that you understand what you're what you're getting into. Um, if you're paying for the project on your own. One of the other tips is you don't want to pay any more than 10% of the total contract price or a thousand as a down payment, whichever is less. Avoid paying in cash. You want to keep all your receipts. Keep all of your project documents, including payments and photographs, in a job file. Now, the big one, funding assistance. That's one of the biggest challenges and requests that we have at any of the independent living centers, and it really can vary. Um, some of the considerations you want to be aware of is the location where the consumer lives, whether they live in the city, whether it's rural, what county they live in. For example, I'm in Stockton. We have a bucket of funding available for the city of Stockton. And then we also have a bucket of fu funding for San Joaquin County residents. 
that may include a Stockton consumer, but depending on um, where their location, where their zip code is, we, we have to figure out which bucket we have available. So um, it's really important to read your guidelines when you do have a grant or a loan that you're, you're trying to assist a consumer apply for. You wanna make sure they're eligible. Um, the program year that the grant is awarded. Sometimes there's program years where they're available one year, but they might not be available ongoing. So you'll, you'll wanna be well-versed in that too, or at least do a search. Um, the age of the consumer might be an issue. So you wanna see if that, there's one uh, grant that I'm familiar with, with, I believe it's the USDA. It's a loan option for consumers that need it before the age of 65. It becomes a grant application after the age of 65. So good information to know. The type of disability the consumer has, that could be important as well. Sometimes you'll find grant applications based on the specific disability. Um, whether a consumer is renting or owns their own home is really important. And that will be often in the grant application or not. A lot of times they will exclude rentals. So you'll want to read that information carefully. When you're looking at household income, many of the programs require income information from all members living in the home, not just the consumer. That is another big misconception. Many of these programs are federal or state funded. You need to be very clear that if, let's say it's grandma and she's living with her son and her daughter-in-law, they're gonna be looking at all three of their income to determine eligibility. Um, there's a few exceptions on some of that, but in most cases, we have to explain that clearly to the family that we'll have to get all of that um, income information from them before we can determine eligibility. So that's important to discuss. Um, I mentioned rentals and mobile homes. So some funding programs, grants and loans alike, have limitations or exclude rental properties or mobile homes in their applications. You'll wanna get more details. Some of them will require the owner to apply for the loan. Um, it just depends. It really depends on each each grant and loan. Other programs may require additional documentation from a renter, like a letter from a doctor that indicates a medical need for the modification. Um, we've had where a form had to be notarized by the owner saying what modifications can be done to make sure that it was cleared before the funder was going to move forward. So those little details, you want to make sure that you reach back out to the grantor to find out if there's any information that you might be missing. Worst case scenario is you move forward with a project and then the grantor is not willing to reimburse the center. That's a huge no-no. So um, you wanna know this stuff in advance. Um, oftentimes a tenant will pay the cost for a modification. So an owner or a landlord can approve that, but they, don't, they are not always responsible for the cost of the modifications unless the uh, housing provider receives funding for um, from the federal government, meaning if the home is subsidized, then that might mean that the cost would fall on the owner or the housing provider. Under no circumstances, though, can the landlord require people with disabilities to pay an additional security deposit or to sign a different lease. So you want to be aware of your rights as well. We can help with some of that information too. So if something seems fishy, um, we can always reach out to some of our legal um, partners and kind of make sure that nothing's happening that is not supposed to. Grants versus loans. Um, grants typically don't have to be paid back. They have stricter income limitations on average. The programs vary, like I had mentioned before, eligibility can be based on a variety of factors kind of think of it as a scholarship. You just want to read that in, uh, in detail and not assume that one is exactly like another. They often require reporting to the grantors. So me as a service provider would have to report demographic information on who we helped with this particular grant that could be annually, quarterly, monthly, after completion of a project. That's all important information because you're going to have to be tra keeping track of demographic information throughout. Um, grants can be competitive. 
they're typically more difficult to acquire than a loan. Um, they have project caps, so meaning they can't the project cannot exceed a certain dollar amount. Loans and financing, they will have to be paid back over time. The interest rates may vary. Vendors may offer financing directly, um, but you want to be aware that the interest rate might be higher than a financial institution. So you want to compare. Uh, the length of the loan may be longer than necessary sometimes, so you do want to compare rates. One of the uh, great loans that um, Ability Tools encourages and offers is the Freedom Tech loan. So I have some information on that one for you at the bottom here. We often in my market, um, grants are kind of few and far between these days. So I do have to kind of regularly provide information about loans that might be available as well. Um, here's some other really good resources. So like I had mentioned before, um, if you own your home, this is where it could, could benefit. City and county websites often have emergency home repair programs that can include home accessibility modifications. So if you're having trouble doing an online search and um, you're trying to find that information on the city's website, often you can look under their community development department page. Sometimes it's under a service tab or maybe their housing programs, but usually if you do a search for home repair on their site, you may be redirected. And it should give you application information i know for our area it has a full application um, and the whole process it will explain more in detail and again this is a perfect scenario where you can ask your at advocate to help because we are usually pretty familiar with our own markets and what is available so this is the big question everyone wants to know what grants might be available or where to look so this one's uh show me the money the following types of groups may provide funding. So these are kind of out of the norm ones that you might not think to look for. Associations that address specific disabilities like we talked about a minute ago, um, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, vision impairments, hearing impairments. Any association as, um, may have some information on a specific grant. Again, you'll wanna know the the guidelines for that grant but you can do searches for those civic clubs like the lions and rotary clubs faith-based organizations like churches synagogues mosques all those might have grant opportunities available um, we're all familiar with the va and the veterans administration sometimes people will ask um, or they may not even know a veteran that has a service connected disability might be eligible to slightly higher benefits. So a bigger modification budget than someone that is a veteran, but maybe doesn't have a service connected disability. That's something that, to note. The Department of Energy has weatherization programs. So if the modification is something related to maybe replacing a heater or um, something of that nature, you might wanna look into your weatherization programs. In our county, it's actually on our human services webpage, but you can do a search for these under the Department of Energy. Department of Rehabilitation also offers help with home modifications. One of the ones that folks are not as familiar with that is also through Department of Rehabilitations is through transitional grants. And that's when um, someone is transitioning out of a skilled nursing facility or other similar facility. Um, one of the caveats to this is you really, really want to establish the grant approval prior to someone leaving the skilled nursing facility. Um, that's really important. Um, an independent living center can apply for this. And I believe at this time through the state of California, there's up to $4,500 available um, for a for anyone who is transitioning out and is requiring some sort of home modification. Some of the things that we get asked a lot is um, they're not able to access their home. They need to be able to get a ramp to their house or a lift or something like that. So that will cover some portion of the cost. Again, you have to get this approved prior to the person leaving the skilled nursing facility. Otherwise it's no longer available. Um, another unique one that I had found and I've actually been able to help a consumer was California Victims Compensation Board. Um, 
this is actually for victims of a crime that have been injured. My particular consumer had her disability was actually caused by a hit and run accident and had a claim through them. And we were able to file, she had a lifetime benefit and we were able to file um, an additional claim when her new wheelchair needed to be replaced. So she, she was able to acquire this motorized wheelchair initially when she had her accident and her and I had spoken later down the line and we were able to get some information about helping her acquire a replacement one. I think it was sometime like eight years later. So it's it's um, it's not something that people typically know, but it's good information just in case you think your consumer might fall in that. Um, you can search more on their website as well. Um, some of the typical ones that we see here are the community development block grants. Those are available through the city and the counties. The nonprofits can apply. There's a lot of competition these days. So um, it just depends on whether or not your area provides them. I had mentioned in the rural areas, we have the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture offers some home modification loans and grants as well. So those are some other out of the box resources that you can look into. Um, this is my information here. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Again, I'm Michelle Rosado with Drail, and here's all my contact info. You're welcome to shoot me an email if you have any questions. And now I will turn it back to Catherine. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you to all of our panelists and all of our attendees being so patient with our technical difficulties. Um, I went ahead and um, made sure to let Michelle finish up it kind of cut into our Q&A but we'll we still have a good seven minutes left to answer some questions here um, if our panelists wouldn't mind um, if you feel like sharing your emails in the chat that way people can reach out to you if they have any individual questions they can also do that um, we have a question in the Q&A for AT for hearing loss are there any devices that exist that allow individuals to communicate when English is not their primary language so they can't read English. I think that that one was aimed toward Jose. Sorry, I was trying, I was writing my email on the chat. Uh, I guess I would need more information about that. Or are you saying that the consumer, like is he trying to communicate with someone now who's in a different language or? was material provided in one language and then needs to be translated to a different language. I'm not quite getting the question, sorry. If that attendee can go ahead and clarify, um, we'll go ahead and address your question as soon as the clarification comes through. Um, I do have a couple of those tips if we have some time, if um, I can add to whatever Jose has to put in. Um, we have Michaela from DAC asking, do you happen to know of any grants that do free home modification? Um, well, there it, it really depends, it varies. I've listed some on the slides there. Um, oftentimes, uh, let's see, ones I can think of right off the bat would be um, the National MS Society. They have some free, um, some home modifications, but they do have a cap. Um, the, like I said, the, the Veterans Administration, if you have a veteran that you're working with, they're, they're really great to, to reach out to. The CDBG ones, those are the ones that we typically apply for. That's a grant cycle. Um, so usually what I would do is if we're not sure of an area, because I, I know we're speaking to people in different areas of, of California and I think I think outside of California as well. Um, I would I would highly encourage to reach out to the ILC to see what their local area is. We at Drail have six counties, and I can tell you in six counties there are everything's different. So we have one county that we know we can readily access funds, and then we may have another county that it's a real challenge. So it it really just varies. Um, I tried to give some suggestions, but another really good website that I found is the Ability Tools website. There's a there's a resource link that says how to pay. 
I would really encourage reaching out to there. I found so many different, um, so many different ones I had not thought of in the past. And I just, I just sent information out to them. So I introduced myself. I asked some details. I will often encourage folks to get in contact with their city and their county representatives. Cause again, that's how I found information about for the home loan projects. Sometimes, um, They'll convert those loan programs into grants, so they'll reach out, getting onto different um, um, listservs for your email, like AARP is a really good one to jump onto. Um, anything that's significant to the type of disability, um, those kind of listservs are really good to jump on to get some, some information on any new grants that might be available. So. Hopefully that kind of answered your question, but it's hard to tell you if we're all in different areas. All right, thanks, Michelle. So um, Jose, we got clarification. Um, the attendee offered for the question for Jose, the individual speaks Chinese only, but cannot communicate with even friends or family on the phone because she cannot hear what they say. So this would be for isolation purposes only. She can also only understand slash read Chinese. Just trying to find something that will allow her to communicate with friends and family by phone. I, just thinking about it really fast, I would actually put the phone on speaker and turn on an application like Google Translate. So if they're speaking English, translate it to Chinese, or if they're speaking Chinese, uh, just turn on the dictation app so that the phone could pick up the what they're saying and, and just have it visually for the person. So if they're speaking a different language, Google Translate, if they're speaking the same language and then just making sure that we're doing voice to text so we can know uh, what they're saying by reading it on the screen. Thank you, Jose. Also, Microsoft um, Translate has a really great voice to text option. It's a great captioning option, but it also makes it so that people can be speaking a multitude of languages all in one chat conversation. And so it all translates everything to the language preference that you selected for your interaction in the chat. So that's a good option too. Um, I have another question for Jose. What are some of the latest advances in AT that you're excited about? Something that really excites me with technology is just artificial intelligence and the way it's moving, it's providing a lot of access for people with disabilities. Um, another project that I'm really excited about as a person with CP, I'm really excited about Google's project, Euphonia, and that's a dictation for people that have atypical speech. So a lot of people with CP have speech that can be recognized by dictation software and this uh, Google's project will be able to pick up the different speech patterns that way a lot more people could use dictation. Uh, that's one of the projects that I'm really excited about, but artificial intelligence, anything with it, I, I think that's how the future is going and it's providing a lot of access in, in different technologies, especially for people with vision loss. Great, and let's go ahead and um, expand it out if Michelle or Tonique have anything that excites them upcoming in AT. Let's go ahead and see what you guys have to contribute. <laughs> Oh, you got me on the spot. Um, I I was actually kind of um, curious when the the pan, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the person had mentioned the the translator, and I need to find the link. But I was under the impression that there are also headphones that you can wear, so that when someone is speaking, you'll actually hear the translated language. Um, don't know how much they cost, and I would probably follow up to see if I can get some links. Um, but I don't know if that scenario would work with, with the consumer or not. Um, I would imagine that they both would have to have it or someone would have to have the app, and then the other person would be wearing the headphones. But as a bilingual person, I think it's a, an incredible, um, just for living in California, to be honest with you, this is a daily challenge that we have. Sometimes there just isn't um, a language spoken and there's language lines that we can use um, for businesses, but that would be a great um, add, I think, to business. That would be so incredible if we can, we can uh, kind of get to that point someday. 
and I'm sorry, I don't have names right now, but I know it's in my mind. So if I can find any information I can share later with any of the attendees, I'll definitely give that information to, to Catherine. Great. And we're actually out of time. Tonique, if you want to yell something out, you totally can. Nope. Oh, she's good. So, <laughs> I want to thank all of our wonderful panelists and our sponsor for coming out today and providing such a wonderful presentation. Lots of great information. And thank you to our attendees for joining us today. Um, I hope to see you guys in the next panel. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>